Um, I have a video of Michael Irving that we're... Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Damn. Ow. That hurt. <laughs> Damn. Fucking win. Ow. Well, good Thursday, Thursday morning, friends. Mark Holmes here, as always, without Joe Boo, who's holding down the fort at the Red Brick House. But we do have Joe Bear over there falling over. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Make sure you hit the subscribe button because it helps us here on the Joe Boo Sports Report. And Lord knows we need some help. We definitely need some help. We need divine intervention. We need something to happen to wake the Cowboys the hell up. I have to say, that opening clip there where I was sitting out the pond and the wind blew my tripod over it, it literally hit me right here in the side of the head. That hurt because it's one of those spots that, you know, it's like the bone and the edge of the eye. And I was like, wow, that's stung. But literally... That's how it feels with the Dallas Cowboys. It is so frustrating that you have a decent team that's gone 12 and 5, and they won't do anything extra to try and get over the hump. You know, Micah Parsons said people are definitely going to be very surprised how good we really are. Even outside of the star, the Cowboys carry expectations. ESPN analyst ranks the Cowboys as the third best team in the NFC behind San Francisco and the Detroit Lions. Um, Eagles would probably have something to say about that and don't like that, but you never know because what always happens, what always happens is teams that were great last year, can fall and teams that you're expecting to do nothing all of a sudden do great things the eagles when they won their one super bowl they were the fourth place team in our division the year before we know that winning the division is a curse in the nfc east that literally nobody has repeated And that's even after three Super Bowl wins, those teams did not repeat being division winners. Let's hope that the Dallas Cowboys can find a way to buck that trend. Now, we, of course, have (laughs) storylines going into the Cowboys. We um, didn't have our uh, Jerry Jones press conference on Wednesday, which is always there because Jerry Jones was handling his paternity suit. So we didn't get the glory hole. Uh, I think that's uh, leadership is to have some of the guys that glory hole press conference that, uh, have been disappointed uh, to share it with everybody involved. For me, it's a reminder. I too have been here 23 years and uh, it is a reminder. I've been here when it was glory hole days and I've been here when it wasn't. And so having said that, uh, uh, I want me some glory hole. <laughs> so I have that perspective. Yeah. Yeah, we have that perspective. Um, Jerry, we, we as fans, I have to say that this year, more than any other year, we've always been disappointed. And... Um, I think that this year is different, that people are finally fed up to the point where enough is enough. And I'm not sure that some of the fans that have said, you know, because we all say I'm done with the Cowboys, but there still seems to be an undercurrent that is really, really pissed off. And we've heard so many different things that we're at the point where we don't want to hear you say anything. I, I, I honestly don't. I want to see things actually happen. I heard all in, you know, that we were going to go all in. And yet, what have we signed? $10 million worth of contracts? 
Have, is, is that that that's all we've done? Eric Kendrick, Zeke Elliott. We haven't even signed our own guys. And so at this point, I don't know that anybody needs to hear anything more. We just want to see some action. It's not been a secret that C.D. Lamb was going to hold out. You know, of course, there, there was people who were like, well, he might show up. He might show up. But it's not a secret that he was unhappy. And I don't know how anybody thinks that he should be when everybody else is getting paid around him. So if this is a protracted holdout, a Zach Martin three-week holdout, we're just making it harder on our own team. We just are making it harder on our own team. And this is just maddening as a Dallas Cowboy fan. But at least today, the players get on the field, and we got questions. Tyler Guyton, we've heard some rumors um, that they don't think that Tyler Guyton is going to be ready to be a day one starter. That Shima Igoda may be the starter. And my hope on that is, is they didn't pull out the anointing oil to just say, you're the guy, even though we drafted you with our first round draft pick, which says you're the guy that maybe they're trying to um, motivate him because of what happened last year with, um, oh, God, Mozzie Smith. We got too many Smiths and everything else. With Mozzie Smith, where they were like, well, you're going to be the starter, and they were sorely disappointed and so on, that maybe he didn't put in the work that you wanted to to get that spot. That maybe with Tyler Guyton, you kind of say, hmm, you know what, you're not ready that it'll light a fire underneath him to really step up in training camp and put in extra work to get that starting role where he'll be better day one. Let's make, be clear here. That left tackle is the most important spot on the Dallas Cowboys offensive line, that in center, because that is the blind side of the quarterback. One missed block could be your whole season. Because the quarterback won't see it coming. So that definitely is a major concern. Igota is a veteran, but <laughs> Igota is a better guard than he is a tackle. So that is a spot to truly watch. Another spot to truly watch is how Mike Zimmer works with these guys here who have been with Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn is more of that guy, that, that, that buddy that friend of yours. Oh man, it's all good. You know, that you hang out with Mike Zimmer is that guy that's going to hold you accountable and put a foot in your ass and to see how he works with this defense. See Mike Zimmer, you know, he's done four, three and three, four and so on. The thing with Mike Zimmer is I believe that he's been coaching long enough to understand. I may have an offense or defensive philosophy as a coach that I want to do, but I don't have the personnel necessarily to do what I want right now. How can I take the best ingredients? I don't know if you've ever, you know, you come home from work and you're, you're trying to cook dinner and you look in the fridge and you look in the cabinet and say, what do I have to work with here to try and make a meal? Because I don't have everything that I want, but I need to get something because I got a family to feed. And that's where Mike Zimmer has got to look and say, well, I got this edge rusher who is a hybrid that can do all kinds of different things, okay? You know, I don't really have the real big horses that I want in the middle, so what can I do with these smaller, quicker guys? I do have some really good cornerbacks and safeties and things. How can I use them to protect my linebackers? So it'll be interesting to see what he comes up with with this defense right now because we know that the Cowboys – they ain't signing anybody, although this is the time of year when they start checking the waiver wires and look at bottom basement signings for guys to put on the roster. And occasionally they do find a diamond in the rough that does work out for them. 
So let's get through this first practice. Let's see how Zeke looks um, coming back. For the Cowboys, is he energized after having gone to New England? How Dak Prescott's form is and everything else. We'll see if there's actually an interception count this year like there was in practice for last year. And um, burning questions. Is this Dak's last chance in Dallas? To me, you know, I take so much shit. I literally take so much shit from people because I sit here and I say, Dak's good enough to win a Super Bowl. As I look out and I see what the Dallas Cowboys do, as we are all pissed off at Jerry and Stephen Jones in the front office, as we talk about draft picks that didn't pan out last year, like Schoonmaker and Mozzie, uh, and so on, and Overshone being injured. The mistakes that they make on letting go guys like Amari Cooper and then signing Michael Gallup to a big extension. That all of these mistakes that when I am old enough to remember how the Cowboys were hitting when they traded Herschel Walker and got those draft picks and were drafting ringers, that when they were bringing in guys like Nate Newton that they were hitting, that they did 51 different trades and it paid dividends. When they went out and got a Charles Haley for the defensive line or a Deion Sanders, and now we can't even get our own players in training camp. I don't see how everybody can look and say, it's just that guy's fault that we're not winning the Super Bowl. When Troy Aikman had Hall of Famers all around him, all around him had an incredible coach that was a motivator that kept people accountable, had a Jerry Jones who was a wheeler and dealer and made deals and get done. This is not the same Dallas Cowboys, but we're expecting the same results. Every team out there that truly has aspirations of winning a Super Bowl is trying to turn every rock over to try and get better. They're, they're bringing in better receivers or, or upgrading the running backs. They're making trades to say, let's see what we need for our quarterback. What do we need for our defense? We don't. But yet, when they play better than they should, and let's be clear, you don't have a quarterback who broke a thumb, had a down year. You do nothing to help him you get rid of one of your lead running backs, you don't expect them to be a playoff team. You don't get rid of a pass rusher and Randy Gregory. You don't get rid of your number one wide receiver, your number three receiver, two of your starting offensive line, and expect that team to be a 12-win playoff team. You don't. That says more about the players that you have here that have busted their ass to be the best they could be without getting the help from the front office. Let's answer these burning questions and get the day going. No reason to take him out of the lineup, and I don't think he'll play his way out of the lineup. And then finally, Kmart, let's talk about the Cowboys who opened training camp in Cali today. Is this Dak's last dance in Big D? Greeny, it should be. But something tells me maybe there's going to be a surprise and Dak actually wants to remain in Dallas. Um, I don't know. Dak just, just doesn't seem like he's got that mercenary gene in him where he's like, you know what? This is my time. I'm going to stick it to you. He has always talked about being a Dallas Cowboy quarterback. He loves that. But if it's me, I'm going. Well, he may have some options, but we do have a developing story. I mentioned the Cowboys flew out to Oxnard, California yesterday. C.D. Lamb was not on that plane, and Adam Schefter reports that C.D. Lamb is not expected to report today. We know he's been unable to land a contract extension, so he is not expected to report to training camp today with the rest of his team, which will mean that as of today, C.D. Lamb is officially holding out from Dallas Cowboys That's training camp. We've been talking about this forever. We have been talking about the big three contracts in Dallas, the quarterback, the receiver, and the pass rusher. 
Jerry told us that they were going to be all in. I think we thought they would get all of them you done. You thought he meant that. Well, well yeah, exactly <laughs> right. We made the mistake of actually listening uh, when he spoke those words. We thought, well, they'll get all three of these done. Well, maybe they'll get two. Well, maybe they'll just get one of them done. Well, they've gotten none of so them done. Absolutely so, Lewis, positively now positively. the rubber hits the road. Mm. What does it mean that C.D. Lamb is not in camp today? Well, it means the fact that, look, over the past three years, someone who was ranked in the top six in terms of receptions, yards, and receiving touchdowns, someone who, who basically carries the load for you in the passing game, someone who plays a position that, by all accounts, is trending towards being the second most important position in the game of football, I don't care which level you're talking about, is now not in training camp, is now not working towards you actually fulfilling your expectations that we talk about every year, which is to get to the playoffs and advance in the playoffs and advance not just in the playoffs, but advance yeah. to the Super Bowl. You don't have that key part of the puzzle here, you know, in training camp, working with your quarterback, who you also don't have signed to a long-term contract, who also has all the leverage on you going into the 25 season, and you still haven't gone ahead and signed your your franchise pass rusher to a long-term deal anyway. Look, I was someone who gave them the benefit of the doubt, saying, look, there's plenty of time to get these kind of things done in the offseason in terms yeah, of getting your big three happen. signed. And so when he says he was all in, I assumed that he meant, look, my three pivotal players who play the three most important positions in football, quarterback, wide receiver, pass rusher, we're going to be signed to long-term deals, and then we'll fill out the rest of this roster around them. Every team in some form or fashion has to do that. You have none of them signed. You have none of them. And as a matter of fact, the quarterback is sitting there going, wait until it's my turn to really put the screws to you. The wide receiver is going, I'm not even showing up. And the pass rusher, he's sitting there going, well, you already know what's going to cost you for me. Mm -hmm. So what, what's happening right now? Yeah. Nothing. What is happening? So, so Tim, here's the way I, I look at this. And you tell me if I'm looking at it wrong. I, I'm very bad at art, right? Like when I was a kid and you would have to draw up. Like I, you could never decipher what animal it was I was trying to draw. But what I, even I could do was when they gave you the little numbers and said, make this blue and make this red and make this green, I could do that. I could color within the numbers. <laughs> the wide receiver deal is that, right? It's been made. Mm. The, the template is there. It's literally, this guy got paid, this guy got paid, this guy got paid. He slots right in the middle there. The deal is in front of them. It is literally coloring by the numbers. And so, Tim, what does it mean mm. that for whatever reason they haven't gotten it done? I think that it gives you reason to question, you know, how Dallas is negotiating with these players. Like, like what are they doing? You know, are they saying, hey, you live in, you live in Texas. It's an income, you know, tax-free state. And so, like, this is what the number is here because it's comparable to what the number would be in California. Like, it wouldn't be mm. the first time an organization tried to do something like that. Like, like to me, it just makes you wonder because, Greeny, you're exactly right. Like, there is, a, there is color by numbers. There is an absolute roadmap to what uh, the, the top wide receiver should be making. Like, there is. Other wide there receivers is. have gotten deals. And by the way, everybody else is also looking at it because the next guy that gets a deal is going to be, you know, if it's CD, CD plus a dollar. Like, that's just, that's what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's it's a little puzzling. It, it, a little. I think... I think it's fair to start to say, yeah, Jerry Jones has been this great businessman, but how are they negotiating with their own players? They're not. That's a great point because when you look around the league, the average team has spent $112 million in, in free agency. The Cowboys have spent $17 million. And not saying you don't just build your team through free agency. You obviously build a team through the draft, but, but – the Cowboys act like they're the only team in this position. They, yeah. You know, Stephen Jones recently said in, on a podcast, I believe, he said, you know, we're trying to play Houdini here, yeah. trying to keep all these guys. Hi, welcome to being an NFL GM and exec. That's yep. literally your job. Because if you draft well... I, I, I never you, like to agree with her, but she's 100% right. You have to pay all of them. This is not a, a, a problem that's unique to Dallas. Other teams have figured it out. Other teams... Like, jo like the Buffalo Bills with Josh Allen. They, Brandon Bean may have gotten criticized for paying Josh when he did, but he was very happy because he knew the market was just going to keep going up. And that's what you do. You try to forecast. You try to read the tea leaves. What is that guy going to get? Okay, now we got to make sure we pay this guy that. And the fact that they have three stars on their team and nobody is signed, 
I, is crazy. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure how this is resolved. I, I find myself confused. They're acting like they know something no one else knows, and maybe they do. Maybe we'll find out there was some. No, they don't. What I think the bottom line is is I think that Stephen Jones. The reality is is. When you think about contracts, they always wait and wait and wait and wait. And then they mess them up. And then in a last minute hurry, they end up messing them up. Randy Gregory's, although we are fortunate that that did get messed up, but, you know, trying to put in the clause at the last minute, allowing players, which I don't understand is you let Amari Cooper go to Washington and get, get his deal with them. And he comes back and you end up signing him. It's like you don't know what a player is worth. You have to wait until somebody else gets signed to figure out, you know, what what should I pay him? What's a fair amount? I don't want to overpay. And the thing with the Cowboys that worries me here is when the Cowboys signed Brandon Carr, Brandon Carr was a good cornerback, but they overpaid for what they got from him. They were paying for him to be like Daryl Revis, and he wasn't Daryl Revis. It wasn't the play. He played well for us, but the expectations were so much higher that he literally was just trashed. And so after that, Stephen Jones got in his head that you can't sign free agents because you're overpaying for an average player. You're paying them great money, and he refuses to do that. And so then... You go through, and you end up signing Michael Gallup to a, a contract that's a disaster. It's crazy that he is now retired, and we're taking a $4.3 million dead hit this year and an $8.7 million one next year. And that's happened, mind you, right now. We have a dead hit for Zeke Elliott for the second year from his contract, even though he's back on the roster. We're paying $6.1 million in dead money on top of his contract. That's not Zeke's fault. That was the Joneses for doing the contract that was so far out there that it was stupid. And this, my friends, is what's holding the Cowboys back. When we sit here and say we don't have money to pay Dak or CD and we're paying $20 million in dead money, those are the mistakes that are actually killing you. And we look and we say, it's Dak. No, it's the Joneses. All right, good people. At least this afternoon, we'll be talking about. Because we sitting here, I supposed to be the franchise player. We'll be talking, we're in about, here practice. talking about practice. I mean, it, listen. We'll be talking, talking about, about practice. Our folks here, as always, I want to thank you See all you. for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Sports Report.